So, welcome to episode three of the 8020 Rockstars podcast. Very excited about a lot of things today. Number one, you can see we have a different conference room environment. Got new camera angles, feeling this uh, angle better than the last two. Um, we have Chris Summers here, super excited to interview. And uh, thank you guys for being patient waiting for this episode. It was a busy past couple of weeks. We were in Austin. Had a lot on my plate, so from now on, you're gonna be seeing episodes on a weekly basis, and that's my commitment. So there won't be a three to four month, or a three to four week gap. Um, so I got Chris Summers here. Chris is, is a very, very well-known name in the Philadelphia real estate market, if you haven't heard of him. He's been in real estate for about 15 years, right? Uh, runs a $100 million plus team of about 20 realtors. Uh, I, I know you personally invest yourself too a little bit, right? I mean, Ron, investing in real estate, I think, is, is a cornerstone of, of, of our business. Right. Alan Baum used to quote, he even said, Chris, you know, if you're an agent, you make your money, your income selling real estate, you know, but people build wealth owning real estate. Right. So, big, big uh, proponent of that. It's huge. So, I mean, we can talk a little bit about that too. I'm, I'm curious to know a little more. Um, so, Chris is, I'm very excited to have him on the show. And I think we're going to learn a lot today. So, and I'm sorry, the most one of the one of the other um, most important parts is he's the president of the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors. I'm saying that right? Correct. Um, so I think he's going to give us a different perspective on some things about the what's going on in the Philly market, trends with realtors, real estate laws, all that that I personally don't really know a lot about what goes on at GPAR. I'm going to say GPAR for short. So uh, anyway, excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Rodney. So. Um, let's just start. I, I, I've i seen you mostly from afar. Obviously, we've been, how long have we been in our KW office here? Um, since the beginning of the year. Beginning yeah, of the year? Not even one year yet. So it's been eight, nine months or so. Like, I've seen your team in production, you know, the numbers you guys are putting up, some of the cool developments like Kensington Courts, I see online on Facebook. Yeah. The ads that you guys do. Um, but how did you get into, uh, what were you doing before real estate? That's a good question. I get asked that a lot, Rodney, and I think, you know, I kind of got lucky with my past professions kind of maybe tied into do, doing real estate. So um, I, I guess I'll, in my age, will kind of be uh, known once I say what I, I graduated from college in 1990, University of Maryland, you know, with a business accounting degree. And so after that, I got my CPA license. You know, I worked with uh, the federal government. Um, Deloitte and Touche, you know, for a number of years. Nice. And then after that, um, I was in D.C. I moved to Philadelphia to be a financial consultant. So the background, you know, is you have the CPA, you have some numbers, you have financial consulting, which kind of you know ties into investing. But it really didn't do too much else, you know, you know for real estate, you know, because it is a different industry. But obviously, there are some attributes there that that help, you know, as, as a new agent, which was two thousand four. All right. It seems like yesterday. Right. Ha. So when you moved to Philly, um, you said you were in DC before. Correct. When you moved to Philly, was the decision to start to get into real estate like at the same time? And did you know you were going to be an agent first, or were you, or did the investing start back then? Or how yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. Like you know, I moved to Philly not to, it had nothing to do with real estate. Okay. You know, it was like a friend of mine. You know, was a stockbroker. And he's like, Chris, you know, you know, I'm having fun doing this, you know, making money. And I'm like, you know, I was getting a little bit bored, you know, at Deloitte and Touche. I'm like, all right, so let me do that. And I knew no one in Philly, yeah. you know, at, at, at that time. I moved up, started to get started, and then he moves to Florida. You know, it's like my one friend, you know, <laughs> that goes, you know, you know runs away. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, but then fast forward, like the internet bubble hit. Yeah. Um, you know, tough, tough time. I, mean, I certainly learned a lot about investments. I didn't make any real estate investments until I got into real estate. Okay. But even then, when I got into real estate, you know, I kind of talk about this, you know, at, at GPAR sometimes for new member orientation. You know, I didn't have, you know, family or, or friends that were buying or selling real estate. Sometimes people, they, they get their license, they, you know, they have family and friends, they, yeah. they get a few deals that way. So I, I basically kind of clean slate you know, didn't really have anything other than sales experience and, mm -hmm. and, and dedication and commitment to like, you know what, you know, let me just kind of dive into this. Cool. So were you like solo for a while or how many years did you go before? I know you were at 20 agents now, but Correct. that progression? Yeah, I mean, it's actually, you know, trickled up a little bit. Like we're like 25 plus agents, get a little uh -huh. crazy, which is why I might be stressed out, you know, sometimes. But, um, 
you know, a, a good friend of mine, um, basically, you know, there was a time for being a stopper for that internet bubble hit, like I needed to do something else. And he's like, Chris, why don't, you know, I'm doing, it's like the same thing with my friend being a stockbroker. He's like, hey, why don't you do that? So I'm like, so why don't you do real estate? I'm like, okay. Um, and so that was in Northeast Philadelphia. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, I kind of started, you know, solo, but more, I kind of started, you know, on maybe his team per se. And gotcha. then, you know, he you know, was like my mentor, you know, did it for a little bit, got busy. Once I got a little busy, I got, you know, my own assistant. And at some point, he wasn't really too happy. Even when I broke off, right. um, you know, I, I went out on my own and then started to, to build the team. I probably might have been a few years, you know, after you know, two thousand four. Okay. And when you say Northeast Philadelphia, do you mean like a lot of it, Kensington, Fishtown area that you're operating in, or further? Uh, no, this was like much further out. You know, more so like you know, I started at Remax Affiliates Northeast. You know, which is like Academy, yeah, um, and or Frankfurt and Linden. So I was yeah. more, you know, up there. So, you know, my first sales was mostly all, all Northeast. And then nice. that, re, we, you know, um, one of the Remax offices kind of broke out and went to Port Richmond, um, you know, more like 2007, 8, 9 kind of thing. And then I had the opportunity to buy into the Remax franchise. Okay. So then in 2009, you know, we moved from Port Richmond to Northern Liberties and, and had... Remax access, so, and then okay. throughout this time, like my, my my team grew. Okay. I must say that the best recruit, yeah, you know, was my wife Stephanie. Nice, yeah, because she really kind of brought in, you know, the, the innovation, and you know, the, you know, it was like, you know, the, you know, the beginning part of the summersteam.com and yeah. and blogging and video and things of that nature. Awesome. So, and let's like, so I guess if we fast forward till today, so you have about almost 25 agents, or how are you guys set up like agents, admin, do you have VAs, or all your agents working with buyers and sellers? Do you have a, how's your system like? It's a, it's a pretty good diversified mix, Rodney. Um, you know, I do have two full-time assistants, okay. you know, which kind of mostly support on the operation side, and they will kind of help, you know, the agents, you know, with logistics and whatnot, and, um, you know, operations and so forth. I also have two full-time, well, not really, well, essentially full-time marketing people. So they're not agents, yeah, you know, but they really help with, you know, the digital media, sure. um, marketing, kind of planning and, and, and strategy in terms of whatever it might be. You know, the digital media, you know, video, you know, fill in the blank. So, you know, it's not, you know, Stephanie or me, you know, kind of like constantly updating, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Or, you know, if you, you have to, like I learned over the years, like, you know, leverage is key Heck yeah, yeah. to be able to move move forward. And then I can kind of concentrate on, you know, client development, you know, lead generation, you know, the current deals that are pending for myself in addition to supporting yeah. the team and, 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 and growing. So that's a decent ratio then. You have like four admin for, I guess it's not a one to five-ish sort of one to five, one to six ratio. Correct. Like, you know, I think the good news, you know, but, you know, so for the other agents on the team, you know, the, the newer agents are, are, of course, dealing a little bit more with buyers. But, you know, there are some yeah. very seasoned agents that, um, you know, that, you know, that I love and that are really good friends of mine. They could certainly be solo if they want. Sure. But I think it's because of the, the collaboration. It's because of the infrastructure. You know, a lot of those, you know, folks will you know, get a lot of listings, you know, one woman in particular, that's really all she does is, is new construction mm -hmm. listings. But, you know, she has the summer scheme marketing infrastructure behind her, right. where that might be more difficult, you know, if she was a solo agent right. for her, you know, to wear all those hats. Yeah, that's huge value. Correct. Because you build, a, you build a really big brand in the past. Right. Years. So, are you seeing any trends right now? Like, just, I mean, say starting with your team, like, I know we're, you know, we're in fall 2019 in the 10th year of a, of a market that's been going like this. Yep. Um, it's still a pretty strong seller's market in yep. most areas. Yep. I'm assuming probably, you know, a lot of the, you operate a lot in Fishtown, Kensington, around there. Yep. Like any trends you're seeing early stages of like this, I'm sure everybody's wondering like, all right, when are we going to do one of these numbers? Right. Like, are you seeing are price listings starting to sit any longer? Or are you still selling through some of the developments like Kensington Ports quickly or? I mean, I think, you know, in Philadelphia, Rodney, like, you know, we're very fortunate, you know, to have, you know, this large, you know, buyer pool and, and a foundation with eds and meds and, yeah. you know, new companies coming. And, you know, we don't have our average median sale price isn't as high as, 
you know, many other cities. So like when we're at, at Mega Camp, a great time hanging out, by the way. Yes. We got to know each other more. Yeah. You know, we're hearing about other agents in other cities. You know, maybe that <clears throat> shift is, has started or, you know, has already begun. Right. I kind of like that analogy, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm a sports guy. Mm-hmm. You know, is that, that baseball analogy. You know, we're in, you know, the eighth or, or the ninth inning. You know, but if you go to a baseball game, you know, with all those relief pitchers, right? You know, the eighth inning, the ninth inning, those two innings can go on forever. You know, so like, you know, maybe our cycle, you know, just perpetuates, you know, a few more years. But I think even with that, you know, like, yeah, where I'm involved in, like, you're right, like, whether it's new construction or, you know, renovations or just, you know, your, your regular buyers and sellers, that, you know, 200, you know, to 500, even sure. you know, the, the 600,000, you know, that's a pretty, solid sweet spot in our market, you know, with interest rates being so low and these neighborhoods being so attractive and rents being high, yeah. you know, the, the wide rent when you can own equation, you know, is very powerful in addition to growth in these neighborhoods. So, I mean, yeah, at some point, you know, things kind of have to shift a little bit, but I think even when it does, yeah, maybe it's just going to be more of a natural market versus you list something, maybe there's multiple offers sold in a week. I think, right. you know, we've been a little bit kind of fortunate with that, you know, but it's been, that's a tough market for buyers and buyers agents. They might have to submit four or five offers before they even get property. Yeah. I mean, a couple of buyers, I'm not working with a ton right now, but it's definitely been, been seeing that. But I, it's, it's good to hear that perspective though, because I sort of feel the same way. Like Philly, like you said, some other cities, I don't know, watch DC, we're in between two other very large metro areas. Mm-hmm. And our affordability is like off the charts in comparison. Correct. You can still buy a new, like you're selling the units somewhere in the fours, I'm assuming. And you can buy a new three bed, two and a half bath, three story place, or or a big condo, whatever, and your payment could be, I don't know, 1800 or, or, or less, like with the tax abatement, which is obviously the tax abatement is an important part of the conversation for the future. But yeah. you, you mentioned Kensington Courts. Yeah, it's my little plug, kensingtoncourts.com. You know, where else can you get new construction, roof deck, right. in the low 400000 range, you know, with a tax abatement and depending on the down payment, you know, your, um, you know, your mortgage payment, you know, might be fifteen, sixteen hundred. dollars 1600 You're renting anywhere else, you know, in 19125 for that type of product, you know, the, the rent's going to be 2000 Yeah, 22 plus, you know, yeah. so, but yeah, that's, that's a great project. And it, you know the great thing about that project too, which is the great thing with all these neighborhoods, you know, sure. fill in the blank. You know, Northern Liberties, you know, had its kind of transformation in 2004, 2007, and then obviously it keeps going. But mm-hmm. you know, like like who would have thought Frankfurt and Lehigh five years ago, you know, would be the Frankfurt and Lehigh that it is today? You know, just driving by there now and just right. seeing what's there, and then that you know, transforms north of Lehigh. There's already tons of things happening over there. And you have some people who be like, oh no, why would I buy there? It's, you know, but you know, it's the people that have the forward vision, you know, vision, maybe people that bought in Northern Liberties in 2004, the people that bought in Passing on Square in 2007 or eight, Fishtown, you know, you know, back in the day, people would be like, oh, I'm never gonna go north of Girard. Yeah. And then now people are like, I want to go north to truck, you know. It's so super. I mean, it, everything and, there, and that's the case, you know. With all, you know, you take your little city hall, draw that circle around it. So it's yes. all those neighborhoods, you know, just kind of, you know, contracting or expanding, I should say. Yeah, that's huge, and and, and I think about that. That one pops in the mind for me in particular, the, the Kensington Courts, because I remember that lot was like literally sitting on the MLS for a long time. Go. Like, like you're saying, like how these neighborhoods expand and and. and Couple years pass and all of a sudden the the bars reset and I loved, I remember driving by there like three four years ago. I'm like, oh yeah, like, what? <laughs> yeah, or it kind of gets back to like when there was a down market. I remember like blogging about one nine one two two South Kensington. This is going to be the best zip code in the future. Right. I'll take ownership of that. It was a good prediction. You know, it's happening. And as a result, when the market was down, you know, my wife and I we bought you know a number of investment properties there. Sure. We put. Like, why are you buying there? I'm like, I like it. Um, and the theory wasn't, you know, it doesn't take a rocket science. You know, I live in Northern Liberties. So you have seen the progression up. Right. People get priced out of here. You know, they go here. Then this happens. They get priced out of here. And then they go here. Obviously, you know, people can still afford that. Sure. But it's just that natural kind of expansion kind of thing. And it's, and it's the same thing that's happening, you know. You probably know my area is West Philly that yeah. I focus on. 
it's literally the same thing. Like you have Mantua and the good parts of the university city, like Spruce Hill, Baltimore Avenue, right, that. right. And then above Market Street, like five blocks out of Mantua, it's like, yeah. But you're still like, you know, Parkside and all that. You could still like walk right to Fairmount Park, which in any other city, right. that won't be able to walk to a park that huge. To me, it screams like I can see in, ten, in five or ten years from right. now, it's going to be like ding, ding, ding. Everything, everything around here is going to be uber expensive that's so, where i might need to buy my next few properties but I, I remember back in the day like university city might have only been up to you know this street 42nd and then you know a few years later oh, this is university city too and a few years later this is you know so it's that same kind of concept whether it's west philly you know the river ward section yeah. you know, and, and so forth so do you see um i guess switching gears for a second uh so hopefully the market you know won't it's even if the market does slow down a little bit, it sounds like we've still got a decent amount of growth in a lot of these areas um, that are expanding. Um, like operation-wise from running a team that large, like what challenges are there from how you keep agents accountable to I don't know, production numbers? Like how, is, it, is, it, is it getting, has it gotten, you mentioned you may, you're stressing out a little bit mm-hmm. from time to, you know, sometimes, is it, is it stressful keeping that many people accountable? Um, or is it tough, like after you grow a certain point, like, you know, you, I don't know what your goals are, like for this year, for example, right. but if you're over $100 million, like the, if you're thinking, hey, how am I gonna get to $200 million? Right. It's like, what has to change or what? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it, you know, challenges, um, in my mind, Roddy, become opportunities. Mm-hmm. And obviously when things could be a little bit scattered or when when you are in kind of growth mode, yeah, I mean, obviously there's natural stress and anxiety with that, you know, but, you know, that's also healthy because as a result, that's the catalyst to kind of say, hey, you know, what could be done? What systems, you know, could be put in place? Um, you know, what policy or whatever, or what structure, you know, could be done to kind of help people grow their business. And I've really, over the years, I take a lot of pride, you know, in, you know, the agents that are on my team or even the agents in the office and in, in my team, you know, watching them grow, watching them be more successful, you know, because now I know like I'm having not just the impact personally, but on sure. other people's lives, their loved ones, wife or husband, their kids. And then so to me, well, then that's a little bit more accountability on my end, but it also provides more opportunity for the future. So, you know, I recently got a coach recently and, you know, that was kind of big time for me because like, oh, I don't really need a coach. Because the guy who's up on stage at Megacamp. He was on stage yeah. at Megacamp, you know, but as a result, and I think my team really appreciates this, you know, I'm meeting with, with people more, having one-on-one meetings, having goal setting meetings, kind of making them more accountable, you know, to, to help them grow. And I think it's those kinds of daily activities, you know, in terms of, Hey, you know, show up, be consistent, and, and whether the market's good, bad, whatever. If people just kind of do basic things, not just in real estate, yeah, you know, but in any any industry, yeah. It's so like look at you, you're you're kind of built, you're, you're a little bit, you know, and that's probably from being consistent, you know, going to the gym or whatever it is that you do. Yeah. And I think that's really the same thing about life is is wake up, show up, you know, do what you need to do that day, and things will kind of take care of itself. So I'm I'm kind of you know, got like a little bit of um, re-energized myself awesome. here from being at KW and doing a number of new things. I was kind of doing before Rodney, but now just with a little bit more structure and a little bit more diligence, which is really providing not just energy, but synergy you know, with all the people around it. Does that make sense? It does, and it sounds like I can hear the excitement too. And it's early in the morning, you know? And it's nine o'clock. Right, right. <laughs> So you're doubling down on some of the basic things that you, you know, whether you were falling off it or not, like now you, you're accountable, correct? which is helping you keep the people on your team accountable so that they can, you know, you're helping them live their best lives financially and, and I'm sure get wherever, whatever's, wherever they're trying to get to. And that is going to lead you wherever you're. you're yeah. And I, and I love that analogy, double down. You know, I'd say, you know, whatever's working, you know, with whether it's marketing or, you know, whatever, you know, if it's working, double down on it, triple down on it. Sure. Maybe some other things aren't working, you know, put them you know, to the side. But I think the key part of that, you know, is, you know, lead by example. And I know for myself, you know, when I'm kind of all in on something, that's what I do. Yeah, you know, I'll double down, I'll sure. triple down on those behaviors. Um, you know, then they become habits. 
and then you know things yeah you know, I've had the experiences you know, by doing a b c d d you know from having you know no sphere you know in in Philadelphia to, to building a large team and being yeah. a very successful um, you know realtor you know, broker and owning an office if I could do that anyone could do it right you know it's not really kind of like you know brain surgery it's just being consistent having a great attitude and doing some some basic elements and having you know the right tools and technology behind you to expand to grow. so that's good I'm glad you said that because that, that leads me to another question I had like my mind like let's say obviously you guys have worked with a lot of developers investors do you have an idea what percentage of your business it is I, I mean it's All a part. it's a large percentage you know because we're on the listing side you sure. know of a lot of you know, new construction in the city, you know, fortunately we have, you know, great relationships with developers. Yeah. I don't know offhand, but it, yeah, it's probably at least, you know, a third, okay. you know, of the, you know, but yeah. a large chunk. Which is a lot. So say, uh, cause I'm thinking, you know, say someone's listening to this video and they're a newer agent or seasoned agent, maybe they don't get the investment and development side as much. Like what steps do you think someone needs to take or, or maybe even in a different, Way, what are some of the things, specific things, maybe one or two things that you guys do differently that makes that just have, you know makes you more ideal for a developer to work with? I being in the now I'm I guess I would call myself a developer myself and right. an investor. There's a lot to know, and I think sometimes people get caught up on like there's so much between like the construction process right. and setting expectations with buyers and pre-selling things. There's a ton to know, so like. Well, how did you start? Did you make this like if, if and maybe you did make a decision in the past, like, hey, I'm gonna get good at this, right? Like, what what can somebody do to to get better with you know to get developer clients? I guess you know what's I guess the, the paradox or what's very interesting. I, I was just here two days ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a class on networking and building relationships sure. with with developers, but I think a couple things, Rodney. I think number one. You know, like attracts like, and I think you know if you want to be better at something, you know if you're playing basketball every day, you know sooner or later you're going to be playing you know with better people. Sure. And I was a little younger, you know, I, I was at the sporting club, you know, playing basketball with some really good basketball players. Sure. Um, maybe not the best analogy, but I think you know, getting back to investing, you know, for an agent, like why not set a goal to you know buy one property a year. And then maybe that expands to two. And then what happens is, is you're in it. Like you're, you know what you're looking for. You, you have your own kind of goals or you know, whatever it is. Maybe it's income, maybe it's appreciation, maybe it's a combination of both. You're getting, you're diving into the neighborhood. So what's happening is you're developing that mindset of an investor. And I think the investor developer line, you know, is, you know, it blurs a little bit. Right. You know, some people will, will buy and rent. Some people will buy and sell, and then maybe you get involved in some renovations, some flips, and then that naturally leads to lots and doing new construction. So doing some of that myself, I could have you know a high level conversation, yeah. you know, with a potential client, you know, because I kind of I get what they're looking to do. Gotcha. Number one, and I think number two is behind that. You know, once you're working with someone, you know, it's obviously you know work. Fucking hard. There's, there's my one first word of the day. And you know, if you do a really great job for that person, get the property sold, you know, be consultative. You know, I think some agents like get so excited, they see some development opportunity yeah. and they'll run out like, oh, you can buy this or this, and it could sell for some crazy number. That obviously is not, it's good to be excited, but I think some of my developer clients are very appreciative. They'll come to me and say, hey, Chris, I could buy this, should I? And in some cases, I'm like, no. Mm. If I told them yes, well then yeah, that could be a potential listing, but if it doesn't sell for what they needed to sell based on the pro forma, that's a relationship that I might have just killed. You know, so I think it's that whole kind of puzzle, you know, putting it together. And then when you're helping someone sell a property, I guess getting back to the question of what do you sure. do a little bit different, you know, and that's kind of having a few things that maybe some agents aren't doing. One easy example right now, you know, is video. Yeah. You know, video, more people are finally starting to do it. Yeah. I don't know what took them so long, you know, but, you know, video and YouTube, like all the kids, you know, that's where they are. You know, the millennials, that's where they are. So if you have some high level videos, whether it's a larger development, 
you know, whether it's one property, maybe one new construction property. Sure. You know, how difficult is it, you know, to pay a videographer, you know, one hundred and fifty dollars to do a great right. video, or you know, have yourself be in there. If you have a larger project, you know, you know, be a little bit strategic and do a little, you know, a few more things to, to get more exposure for that, and that's even that much more important. You know, maybe you know, if you have a finished product and it's staged, obviously a little easier. Yeah. You know, but if you're selling something where you got renderings or floor plans or the foundations are in. Yeah, you got nothing else to work on. Yeah, you got to like, you know, you know, think outside the box to kind of create, you know, some awareness and create a buzz and, and kind of create, you know, more exposure, you know, so people are aware of that. Long answer to your question, but I think it's kind of like those three things. I mean, that was hugely helpful. So I think hopefully you paused the video in the middle of that and got it. I mean, the three parts. So, because I, I, I um, do with our monthly classes here too, and I'm like, I think, take, like you said, taking your first step and just buy, buy a little property yourself. Right. It gives you a huge amount of perspective, and you can then have that conversation now. Like, oh, this is the this is the challenges I went through. Even just asking intelligent questions, I find like mm -hmm. when and that people start to get a sense for like, like when I'm like, hey, I bought this place, and this is what happened with my tenant. Like, what are you doing in this house? Right. You know, or what are you doing with your plumbing here to make sure that you don't go to the same mistake? Correct. You can build a relationship so much quicker. With Definitely. Someone who's so that's that's awesome. Yeah, and like you know, like my example is again, like when I had no business, you know, I, I you know, getting back to the basketball, you know, I rolled my ankle, you know, at the sporting club. I just got into real estate. Yeah, you know, I had no health insurance. So like I'm like I some someone fell back for me and gave me crutches, you know, and I'm driving to North Philly, you know, going out in crutches at 28th and Somerset, you know, selling, you know, showing twenty and thirty thousand dollars shells. Yeah. You know, you don't really make much money on those riding, as you know, <laughs> especially if you have a split with someone. Yeah, but it started there. I had a number of clients, you know, that you know that bought you know shells in, in, in certain neighborhoods and and renovated and and, and sold them, and they progress to new sure. construction people. So I think, you know, again, if you're building relationships with investors, you know, that could lead to renovations. It could also lead to, you know, someone, you know, doing new construction. And then, you know, yeah, the big picture is, you know, once you know what people are looking for, you know, is, you know, scouring, you know, the MLS, you know, for, for lot opportunities, having relationships with as many people as you can, maybe to hear about something before it goes on the market. Yeah potentially put a deal together, even if there's no commission involved. Like I just want to get, you know, my clients opportunities. Yeah. I don't really need to make any commission on acquisition. Yeah. I'm more looking to build that relationship because I think as soon as agents stop thinking about the shotgun money approach and kind of think more about big picture yeah. and those relationships, well, obviously the income comes naturally. If you don't really think about it, but you're working hard, like you're making things happen. You know, it comes and, and it comes many times over potentially, you know, versus, you know, being too caught up in like the small movie. I like the big movie. Right. The long, you're thinking long term in Correct. transaction. Correct. When you tell somebody they shouldn't buy something and they don't buy it, they appreciate that much more than, oh yeah. You, like, Correct. And, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, sometimes I, you know, I'm not perfect all the time, but, yeah. but sometimes there may be like, you know, I always like to say the 50 shades of gray analogy, mm. you, know, you know, it is what it is. But, um, you know, but there could be like a little bit of a grayer and I'll tell someone, well, hey, I, it, this should work, you know, the pro forma, we should get this, but I always like to be a little bit conservative yeah. on that out sale number. So that in and of itself provides a little bit more of a cushion sure. for them if it's a little bit higher, you know, obviously market forces, you know, we, we've been fortunate the last few years, yeah. if you buy something now, by the time you sell it, you know, it might be five or 10% higher sure. than where you, where you got it, but then, you know, we're a little bit of that time period now where I think you have to be a little bit more conservative oh, yeah. you know, for the future. Okay, awesome. Um, so let's get into, I wanna talk about GPAR for, um, for a little bit. I, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to ask, like what does, I feel like maybe this is just me. I don't really know exactly some of the main things GPAR does. I know they like, they, they help some of the laws that are that, that are not going to work for industry or some changes in Philly, like they stop those things from happening. They, I don't know if it's a lot of being, I know so little, like, yeah, what do you think are um, some of the, or what are some of the most important things that GPAR does that like nobody might know about? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm glad that you said that because you're, you know, you're a great asset to the community. You're a great asset to the real estate field. 
you know, maybe on the side, say, Rodney, maybe you pop in, you know, kind of join a committee, you know, if you have right. time, maybe end up being on the, the board of directors. So that, that's a, maybe a side conversation. But yeah, I mean, G Park to me, Rodney, is, is like so important for the city of Philadelphia. You know, it, number one, it obviously supports all of the realtors. You know, I think we're well over 3,000 you know, licensed realtors you know, that are members of GPAR, wow. you know, in terms of, of helping them, you know, providing support, uh, helping with grievance, you know, tons of training, you know, certain offices, you know, have the agreements with, you know, zip forms and DocuSign. Yep. Um, so the, re- the amount of resources that are there, you know, is huge. Um, and then, you know, GPAR, you know, ties into the state. For the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors, okay. which ultimately ties in, you know, national with the National Association of Realtors, and we've had some people in leadership kind of go up that that ladder. Um, sure. or, you know, Bill Festa, past president of GPAR, I think is on track to be president of the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors next year. Wow! Um, and Al Perry, I think, you know, hopefully, not going would you know, be, tre- be a treasurer. So we have like some people in Philadelphia involved there. Sure. But I think really like you know, the big, and I'm a huge advocate, and I think everyone, in, you know, that's in our field is, I'm a huge advocate of home ownership. You know, I'm a huge advocate of property rights. And that's what GPAR ultimately does, you know, for the consumer, you know, is be extremely cognizant and aware, you know, of what's happening at city council, sure. you know, what policies can potentially hurt promoting home ownership, sure. you know, can hurt investing, you know, that can hurt growth, you know, that can hurt our local economy. And then what can potentially help that? It has nothing to do with Democrat or Republican. It has everything to do with what supports the homeowner, you know, what yeah. supports the housing market. Um, and together, there's a lot of people that are involved with that, you know, is having the relationship with the city council folks to kind of say, hey, you know, what's behind this bill? What's behind that bill? Um, and, you know, if we're not for something, we've been you know, a huge lobbyist against raising the, the real estate transfer tax, mm-hmm. you know, one of the highest in the city, you know, a huge you know, proponent against like these large increase of property assessments where taxes are just, you know, going you know, through the roof. And obviously, you know, from the bigger perspective, you know, the tax abatement, you know, is a, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a hot topic. It's a hot topic. Is you know, you see anything? Yeah, you, there, there's there's so much misinformation. Even the politicians, you know, some city council people don't even really understand how it works. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of people think tax abatement, the people pay no taxes, and that's 100 yeah. percent wrong. And a tax abatement is not just for new construction. You know, it could be for you know, for renovation and. Most of the tax abatement benefits isn't the people buying the million dollar condos at the oh. Ritz or downtown. It's Kensington Courts, you know, that potential homeowner might not own a home. Because the project these, might not be feasible. It wouldn't be feasible from for day the one. For to sell at that price to even do it. Correct. So, you know, you know, there might be some tweaks with that, but the, the long story short, you know, whether it's a tax abatement or anything else, there's a lot of work you know, behind the scenes, you know, with GPAR as far as, you know, looking at, you know, we just had the elections recently, yeah. you know, which candidates to potentially you know, support and you know, when bills come out, you know, to really kind of get involved in that conversation, um, you know, because you, you'll hear about it maybe with the National Association of Realtors more on the national level, mm-hmm. you know, but at the local level, um, you know, GPAR plays a heavy role with that. And I didn't really know that either, Rodney. So, you know, once, you know, I got involved, I'm like, man, these people are doing, doing some great work. Awesome. And even like as current president, sometimes I'd be like, you know what? I, I guess I'm so passionate, like I'd like to do a little bit more, but obviously you, know, you can only do so much too. Yeah, you got a lot yeah. on your plate. I do. Right so um, tax abatement aside, I, mean, I know that's you know, probably the big, one of the biggest hot topics. Is there anything you see coming down the pipe, any major legislation, anything that's gonna, anything that jumps out that like, oh man, we gotta pay attention to this or maybe you know, this is this is going to affect a lot of people in the city, or is it mainly? I mean, I know the tax, but I know what was it, a year or two ago there was like the construction tax. Yeah, that, that they were trying to. I think that got squashed, right? Well, it was kind of like I called that the extortion tax. Like why? I you know, know, like why did this have to go there? And you know, and then you know, the I guess the BIA got involved with that, kind of mm-hmm. worked out. You know, comparable. Or I guess originally it was supposed to be ten percent of a project might have to go towards affordable housing. And they kind of right. backdoored that to, yeah, you know, 1% might go to like a fund. Um, 
I mean, I get, like everything else, it's like the intentions are always good. I understand sure. the intentions. The bigger concept is, you know, what are the consequences in terms of yeah. the local market and finding a better solution, you know, to kind of accomplish a goal. Yeah, you know, so like you can't take a goal and just kind of squeeze it here and make it happen. If you do, you know, that, you, know, you squeeze it out and there, there's, there's nothing left. Right. Um, but yeah, I think the big picture, we talked about the market a little bit, Rodney, you know, is you know, the, the intangible that we have, you know, these neighborhoods are going great, interest rates are low, you know, the, the policy at City Hall is a little bit, you know, of a question mark. Um, and I've heard, you know, getting back you know, to Alan Don, you know, if you look at the permits being pulled for next year um, downtown, maybe for 2021, it's, it's, it's gone down dramatically. No one's really talking about that, you know, but I think the main impetus, what that word impetus? Um, yeah, behind that, you know, is some of the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So we have like this new city council coming in until there's a little bit more certainty, you know, it would be interesting to see how, how that works. My concern is it's like the drip, drip, drip negative things like, you know, the real estate transfer tax, you know, mm -hmm. keep going up, you know, the properties that we talked about that. So like, you know, if the policy continues to attack, yeah. The homeowner, you know, the new homeowners, ultimately, you know, there could be some consequences from that, which has nothing to do with the overall market, you know, but, you know, our Slowly local market, it, it could. So that that is a question mark, you know, for the future, in my opinion. And then the tax abatement is part of that conversation. Yeah, because I think uh, you mentioned what Al Dom was talking about. Cause, yeah, wasn't the number like... Like the total, could, I think it was the total square footage of new construction permits pulled in Center City. Yeah, and it was like, uh, it wasn't like ten percent. Yeah, it was like, just a drop off a cliff. Yeah, like, from a million square feet to like. Yeah, and then and I guess the paradox too is like, you know, people might think that there's a lot of development going on, but like if we compare, you know, Philadelphia, you know, to a lot of other cities, you know, what they have done without a tax abatement you know, is pretty impressive. Mm. And like my goal, you know, to be a part of that, you know, is why not have, you know, Philadelphia be one of the fastest growing cities? Why not have Philadelphia be extremely attractive for small businesses, tech, biotech, you know, to come here and maybe not set up shop right outside yeah, um, and so forth. You know, the more of those, you know, larger companies and smaller companies come in, obviously that's more jobs. Yeah, you know, that's more people being involved in the community. Um, and that's, you know, obviously that fuels the, the housing market as a whole. Yeah, which I'm sure we can take into the whole different conversation. Because when you mentioned right outside, are you thought, thinking about the wage tax or is I, many taxes. Well, yeah, a lot of taxes. Yeah, the wage right, tax right. and many, many other taxes. So, you know, they'll, maybe they'll get it to Montgomery or, but it, and, you know, yeah. even like, you know, sometimes people, you know, will do that, you know, in the city too. You know, the schools are getting better mm -hmm. and I think they'll continue to get better. Yeah, but sometimes, you know, people will, will buy homes in certain neighborhoods and fast forward four or five years later, you know, they'll move to New Jersey, they'll move to yep. Delaware, Delaware County, Montgomery yeah. County, Bucks yeah. County, and they're willing to pay higher taxes because obviously they want better schools. So we're losing some people that way too. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think as you know, neighborhoods, you know, get better, the schools are definitely getting better. Another plug, you know, this might be outdated for people that watch this in the future, but you know, we're sponsoring the Riverboards Run. Sure. The developers that are doing Kensington Courts, I think it's next Saturday, it's September 6th or 7th. You know, where all the proceeds, you know, are going to like seven local schools. Awesome. And, you know, for me, that's like really great to like be a part of that. Like, you know, you're not just selling homes, like, you know, you're, you're giving back, you're giving back yeah. and, and helping the communities. Cool. Uh, I don't know if this will be live. But this may be live like a day or two before that. That's so, okay. so, well, no, so, right. you know, they can they can go next year. I'd be too. very curious. All right, okay, cool. Yeah, so a, it'll be next year. It's an annual event. Annual event. Awesome. Um, yes, yeah, so we've covered a lot here. Um, I guess uh, one of my last questions is: so long, long term, do you have do you have a say five years from now? Are you thinking about like I don't know, are you you're mainly in the growing the sales business? Do you see yourself? Continuing on the same path, do you see any other opportunities? It's probably an impossible question to answer in some yeah. ways. I'm just curious. You know what's funny, Ronnie? Like some people are great at setting the one year, five year, ten year goals. Mm -hmm. Personally, I haven't been that great with that over sure. time. But I think 
at, along the same times, I mean, I, I could look at it this way, five years ago, or even when I first started real estate, it was never my goal to have a, a team of our right. size and, and 25, and, I, and, and maybe if I would have had a goal, maybe it would have been more pigeonhole, you know? So I, I do kind of like going with the flow and maybe kind of building and expanding and adjusting and pivoting, but I think, you know, big picture, um, I just love, you know, being involved. You know, I love, you know, what it's not, doesn't always have to be a developer or investor, you know, when that first time seller sells a home or, or anyone like, you know, being you know, a catalyst, you know, with helping them, you know, get the liquidity or the, the assets that they need to move on, you mm -hmm. know, with their life for the next step or the people that are moving into the communities to, to be involved in maybe one of the, the biggest decisions of their life. And, you know, with all the great people, you know, that we work with in our community in GPAR, I just like being involved in that. So what level it is, maybe I do, maybe I'm doing less sales of my own and my team's doing a little bit more, sure. you know, so that I have a little bit more sanity. That could be part of that. And you know, maybe it's, you know, expanding into, you know, on some level, you know, I love the investing side. I just love, you know, really the real estate side. And I love the Philadelphia side. So it all kind of ties in and with that. Yeah, I just always know that there's, you know, different paths to choose from, which I yeah. like. I like flexibility. I like options. That's great. And you have a ton of options the way you position yourself. So awesome. Uh, is there anything else I should have asked uh, we didn't cover, you think? I mean, I hopefully that's my answer is a little long sometimes, but um, yeah, I mean, it's I mean great. those are great, great questions. I really appreciate, you know, you know, being here, you know, like, you know, it's, and, and at the end of the day, like, you know, I, sometimes I get interviewed or asked, to do something, but you know, it's not just. I guess what I've learned, it's not just me. You know, it's it's. I have a large team of people, and it's together. You know, we built something. You know, pretty magnificent. And I guess the big picture, whether it's you or me or, or anyone that's watching this, you know, for someone to improve or get better or progress, like I, I really like the quote. I think even Gary Keller might have mentioned it. Mega Camp is you become who who you surround yourself with. You know, you know if you're hanging out with people that aren't right. doing good shit, you're not gonna be doing good shit. Yeah, you know, but if you're like, we're hanging out, you know, other people, you know, we're hanging out, we're working together, you know, we're progressing, that in and of itself, you know, is exciting in addition, you know, to, to grow self-development, you, right. know, you know, work development, et cetera. And you're constantly learning too, like you could, there's a lot of people out there who may be in your position, so doing a hundred million a year, and they might think, you know what, I'm good. I don't need a coach. Right. I don't need to. Right. So it's it's cool. Very cool to see you still. Like you know what? I'm trying to get. I'm trying to keep going. I got to talk to somebody else who's, yep. who's even further. So I mean, I think that's huge. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of you know, or you know, on any note, but like complacency kills. I remember years ago, when I first started being a broker. I, I kind of had a coach for a little bit. He was like, "Chris, are you comfortable?" And I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> and he looked at me. and goes. Dude, man, comfort zones kill. I'm like, what do you mean? I, I didn't really know. You know like that. your question. Yeah, and then, you know, so like, you know, having you know the, those goals and like being outside of the comfort zone, you yeah. know, is is really important. You know, with who, who you surround yourself with, or just the simplistic. Like I'm seeing the Gary Keller books up there. Mm -hmm. You have to always be learning. My my hashtag is I like to read ten pages a day. You nice. know, if I read ten pages a day. That's essentially at least one book a month, which is essentially right. 12 books a year. And if they're the books like The One Thing um, or Tim Ferriss, you know, Four Hour Work Week or Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, That's these are life changing potential books. You read 12 of those a year, that in and of itself is going to promote, you know, good mm -hmm. skills, mindset. You know, for the future too. So I'm, I'm a big believer in those things also. It really helps you keep your momentum because sometimes you get lost in the day to day and you need a con I mean, I just think as humans, it's you need constant like 10 pages a day just to bring you real back real quick. Like, right. oh yeah, all right, cool. Correct. And Thank it you. might be the same thing I read in this book or that book and that book. And people are like, why are you reading all that? You know, but sometimes it's just that reinforcement yeah you know, you're, you know you're shooting free throws i'm just gonna stop you've got like you know, you're shooting right awesome all right well i think that wraps us up uh thank you again for showing up thank you for making it here at the 9 a.m uh, thank you guys for watching we will this video should be uploaded well you know by the time it's, it's uploaded you're already watching it so um look forward to 
the next uh, recording the next couple episodes um, in rapid succession after this. So like I said, you'll see episodes coming weekly. Um, please comment below if you have any questions or let me know. Uh, this is a good one. If you have anybody that you think or you would like for me to interview, feel free to leave it in the comments below. And thank you for watching. How about you, Chris? Yeah. Boom. Ow.